Grazie per avermi invitato, uh, Ciro uh, Greco, VP uh, Artificial Intelligence di Coveo. Questa parte la dico in inglese perché non saprei neanche come dirla in italiano. Vishnu, my man, how is your Italian? Uh, uh, pizza, mozzarella, ricotta, that's about it. <laughs> Dude, this was a good one, huh? Ciro came with the fire. As always, uh, we had on Ciro Greco, the VP of AI at Coveo. And he shared a lot of insights. You know, some of the favorites for me were, you know, hearing about the complexity of the business that Coveo has. It's a pretty sophisticated company in terms of the things that they're trying to do, how that maps to particular engineering, you know, you could say trade-offs or, or yeah. challenges that they face and how Chiro and his team really came to the idea that data and data management was their company's core sort of, you could say IP that allowed mm. their business to drive incredible value and ultimately IPO. I thought that was really cool to hear about. what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's not anything new, right? But it is mm. something fundamental where he's like, mm. number one thing you gotta do is just make sure your data is there. Can you get a data moat? Figure out yeah. how to make that be your fundamental asset. and. I loved it, man. I was a little saddened that I didn't get to see his dog Fritz. I heard him prancing around in the background in a few moments, but that's it for this. I think we can jump into the full conversation. Hopefully everybody enjoys it. For those of you that are listening and have never come into the MLOps community Slack, I would encourage you to do that. Or if you want to just see uh, overview of everything that we've got going on in the MLOps community, whether that is the reading group or it's NLP study sessions or roundtables talking about your stacks uh, and presenting them so everybody can give their two cents on your design decisions. We've got cool stuff like that going on. We've got blogs, we've got newsletters. I mean, there's so much that's happening. And so if you want to see that, I'll leave a link for the MLOps community docs page in the description below. And without further ado, let's talk with Cheeto. Cheeto, I mean, your name is better than my other favorite Cheeto that anyone who likes Gamora will probably understand the reference Cheeto de Marso, but you're Cheeto the Greco. <laughs> And I'm so excited to have you here, man. Also, we about a month ago, probably, or a little over a month ago, I got to meet your dog Fritz and we got to talk everything ML Ops when I was in New York. And from that point, it was like, dude, you got to come on the podcast and tell me some of what we just talked about. So with that being said, your story is incredible. We just hit record, but before this, you said that uh, you were a linguist who had no idea what a business plan was, and now you're VP of AI at Coveo. Can you give us a little bit of a, uh, the bridge on how that happened? Uh, really, really glad to be here. Uh, you guys do an uh, amazing job for the community, and I, you know, I kind of start the day sometimes with like your podcast. It's, it's either you or the Daily, the New York Times. Uh, yeah, so it was a kind of, kind of a crazy. I mean, it's not really, there's, I'm not sure there's a bridge there. There's more like a quantum leap at a certain point. Uh, but what happened is that, long story short, so I worked in, a, in, a, in cognitive sciences um, as, a, as a researcher, and I was working on language. Perspective, like when I say language, most of the people like in, in the industry, especially you know, machine learning and so on, naturally go towards natural language processing. Uh, we were doing something quite different. Uh, there were some mixture with that, but uh, I don't know, I got to collect the data from uh, deaf blind patients who developed like a completely new sign language and a way to, to communicate. We we're trying to figure out like models, computational models to understand whether, uh, you know, there's some kind of knowledge in the speakers that can account for the fact that all languages are different, but all kids learn language in five years naturally and so on. So it was, Pretty theoretical, that's what I'm trying to say. And uh, at a certain point, I started working with Jacopo, kind of bridging the gap between what I was doing and natural language processing. It was 2017, so like natural language processing was also very different from what it is right now. Like there was no hugging face, no, 
you know, no GPT-3. And part of, of that was that we felt that there was a bunch of stuff that, that, that this theoretical field was dealing with that could have been useful. And there was absolutely no communication between the two. Like none of my colleagues knew that there was a world, an industry, a thriving industry that would have paid them way more than the postdoctoral fellowship that they were applying for uh, to, to have something out of that. And so we started to so uh, like this, like with the idea that we could have brought something into the information retrieval space specifically that came basically from formal semantics. And then we got $50,000 and we thought it was enough for some reason. And uh, yeah, and, and we basically incorporated a company and flew the San Francisco. You're like, oh my God, we're rich. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like that, totally. And then, yeah, yeah, then we get there and the, that, you know, the rent is like 4K. So it's like, oh no, we need to raise like right away. <laughs> like, <laughs> way before having an MVP, we need to raise. Yeah. Uh, that is uh, that is the uh, stuff startup dreams are made of, huh? A couple money, a couple dollars in your pocket, move to San Francisco and see if you can raise money. <laughs> I, I did all the faces, you know, like the garage, like all that. I did that like literally. It's not a metaphor. Like my co-founder literally lived in the garage. It's like it happened for two years. Man. So yeah. I love that. It's quite the quite the experience. And I would love to get into that. Um, and shout out to Jacopo. Shout out to Jacopo, your your, your co-founder. I believe uh, co-founder and roommate. Yes, sir. He uh, joined us on a podcast episode uh, a couple months ago talking about MLOps at reasonable scale. Highly recommend everybody listen to this episode. Uh, listen to that one. And he still works with you at Covio. That's, that's, is that right? Yes, absolutely. Well, it's, it's as I said, like it's worse than that. He actually lives in the same apartment. As me. So, oh, like, okay. So you guys are still it's, roommates. It's, I, yeah, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. We're still roommates. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, oh, okay. It's, well, it's, uh, yeah. maybe he'll come by and say hi. <laughs> no, he's not here now, but yes, he could. Okay. All right. Well, that's that's awesome. Um, and so I wanted to really start, you know, I think this is a great opportunity for us to to hear the other side of the story that, that Jacopo was telling when, when he joined us. He talked a lot about, you know, what the idea of MLOps at reasonable scale are, what some of the things that he's learned about the ways to do MLOps right you know, from his time at yeah. Tuso and Covio were, but I would love to understand with you, you know, you're the VP of AI at Covio. You've been a part of the journey for a number of years now. The company recently IPO'd. And I'd love for us to spend the next few minutes talking through like what that journey has been like, what some of the lessons you've learned about evangelizing the usefulness of ML and how to build it at Covio has been like an AI forward company. But let's start by understanding what does Covio do? What is the product you guys are selling uh, and who buys it? Right. So Covio is a, is a, a SaaS provider of, they were born as a search as a service business. So the, the main value prop of Covio back in the days was to have a unified index and they were tackling longstanding problem that is usually referred as enterprise search. Um, that is like you have you know a bunch of different systems and the search engine never works on any of them. So you basically just put everything in the same place and you and you have like one search, one federated search on top of them. Then the company evolved uh, in a number of like more specialized lines of businesses. So there is a, one specialization at Coveo that is definitely customer service. So basically it's a search and recommendation as a service for uh, a community web page, or just like uh, literally the web page where where somebody opens a case, uh, a ticket because you know you're complaining about something that does not work with 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 the product you just bought, or you try to understand what to do with a with a product. Um, in that case, like the search engine's purpose and the recommendations purpose is to deflect this person, to help a person to find information so they do not open the ticket, and the company does not have to take care of solving the ticket. Then another line of business that is becoming like increasingly more important and is the one in which we're more involved and I think the acquisition of Tuso also, it, it's one of the main reasons for the acquisition of Tuso is e-commerce. In e-commerce, it's kind of a mirror because like at the end of the day, you still have search and recommendations as your product, but the, pro the problems are wildly different, although they look like similar. And your purpose in that case is the opposite. You don't want people to get out of the website. You want to stick around and buy, right? So 
is is it's an interesting it's an interesting company because you have different line of businesses and different use cases that superficially look alike, but they're very different uh, behind the curtains. And also it's a B2B company. And I think like with respect to machine learning and ML ops, it put us in a kind of a quirky situation. Like most of companies that have machine learning in production and machine learning is somehow business critical are B2C. So we have like, Usually we don't like we're not the kind of company that has like a humongous transformer that is super cool in production that serves like a billion production prediction every day. We're more like sales for Einstein. Like we're more like we have two thousand models that are simpler than you know the the the, the, the recommender system of Netflix, but they kind of need to you know to work all together, and they serve different use cases. So robustness is is the kind of thing that that. That is most important for for Coveo, I guess, than like having like great accuracy, for instance, in certain as far as like machine learning development is concerned. Yeah, that is a that is a fascinating business to be a part of. It sounds like you know the process of of the business evolving through acquisition or through sort of need finding in the market has led to a pretty you know disparate set of like lines of business in terms of like the infrastructure needed to support each one of them. Yeah. And, you know, the first question that I kind of have is like, you know, what is hard about that technically? You know, to me, I could totally see how this could lead to a pretty fragmented set of architectures or a a pretty, um, you know, uh, disorganized process for rolling out ML models or for building um, different technical systems at a company, you know, when you have different business needs that you're responsible for, that is like, you know, the number one case where like, you know, things start to be a little bit, um, how could you say, uh, just disorganized? How do you confront that? And what are some of the other challenges that you see, you know, kind of trying to bring coherence to machine learning at Caveo? Look, like, so we, I guess, like, we have all kinds of challenges, like, also coming from the fact that the comp- when I joined the company, the machine learning team was a fairly small team, and now it's, like, more than doubled. So there's also that problem. It's, like, we grow fat, we grew very fast, and that sort of what it was, like, oh, let's hire 15 people. It's, like, all right, so, and then, like, after six months, we was, like, did we, did that make sense, like, or is there anything we can do to, to have that team to work better and so on? But like in general, the point is, I guess, so there's, there's two main components. One is definitely about the data. So the way in which you conceptualize this is that, uh, although this probably is not what historically was at Cabello, but and it goes back to the reasonable scale kind of way of thinking is, whatever machine learning applications you have, it's a fork in a DAG. And at a certain point, the first chunk of the DAG is basically take care of your data from ingestion to preparing tables that any application can consume. Then that piece is definitely a part that requires a lot of discipline, a lot of thinking, and unfortunately, a lot of legwork that cannot really be speeded up. Very practically, if you have 500 customers, and they integrate the data tracking all differently, you're pretty much swamped in, 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 in working your way to data that are consumable, or, which is I'm not sure if it is better or worse, or you're gonna have only a handful of, of events that you can consume because they are the ones that are like, you know, naturally standardized enough for you to build models on, which is, of course, it's a, it's a missed opportunity. So a lot of what, what we did was to create that framework, a way to track data that is, that is, that is standardized, a way to, you know, to ingest data that is standardized. And it cannot be once for all because the company has more than two lines of businesses. Then the other piece is, okay, once you have that, then you have like then the machine learning and the machine learning can very wildly. Another example is, so personalization is a big deal for digital experiences and Kaleo basically sells better digital experiences. So we do personalization. Now personalization in customer service, uh, you don't have a lot of data, okay? Because people don't go on the customer service page that often. That's not a high volume use case. 
But people will log in because they have to open up a ticket. So I know this person, right? I can build, for instance, a user profile. Uh, B2C e-commerce, still personalization, nobody logs in because it's B2C e-commerce. We only log in in amazon.com, everybody else is pretty much like stuck with the fact that like 5% of their users logs in. So hmm. now we have like the reverse problem. We still have to provide personalization, but we cannot build, a, I mean, we can't build a user profile and then it's gonna help like 3% of the users, which is pointless. So we figured out for instance, in that case, a completely different way of doing things based on the sessions. So the interesting thing is that there are pieces that are common and pieces that are not. And figuring out what these pieces should be and how they should be owned in the company is very interesting for me. Like in general, like I'm very interested when like tools and the way you sh we, you design your, your system meets the processes and the culture. I'm, because in my experience, like the culture beats the software. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know that we talked quite at length about that when uh, I was with you and I'm wondering, I'm always asking people, what are the fundamentals that you think are there that it doesn't matter what your use case is, no matter if you're doing something like the personalization that's different, or if you're doing something totally off the rails uh, compared to the personalization and you're saying, I've got a computer vision use case. What are the fundamentals? Yeah, yeah, totally. Like we, we, we we do have things like that, right? Like you have like, I don't know, like you have a model at a certain point that is basically pre-tagging your, 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 your cases because you want the, the customer service case to be uh, described in the right way so it doesn't get misrouted. Now, nothing of that can be basically used as it is for like an e-commerce use case. It just, the use case just doesn't, doesn't exist. The, the main piece that we focused on and we believe is really the core piece is 100% of the data. Like we, 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 100%, like all the marginal gain in getting like good models, it's way lower than, than having good data in a situation we are. Like if you focus on the data, you're going to harvest so much more benefit. So having that piece is important, but again, tooling is super important. So we, you know, we got Snowflake and Snowflake definitely made our life better. Did that actually solve the problem of how you ingest the data? No, not really, because now we have partners, professional services, random developers who implement the tracking, and they need to know that your choice of getting Snowflake upstream now influences their work. Uh -huh. Because if they do something, they break the, 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 the ingestion, well, there's no amount of, of like, no Snowflake is gonna solve is going to give the inner peace that you need to have. It's the discipline needs to come from you. Well, this is and, something and, that we talked about, right? And it was very much like, hey, I was, I had, I guess you had to have long conversations with the DBAs about immutable data or in the data warehouse, oh, like yeah. you can't touch the data. Like that just doesn't happen. Can you explain that a little bit more? I think it's like, uh, yeah, like we, we kind of briefly touched upon, upon that, like when we met in person, I think it, it, that's a little bit, so I'm glad that that piece is somehow getting more, uh, yeah, widespread, like more and more people started thinking about the data warehouse as a, some form of time machine, basically, right, of, of device that can bring you back in time and, and it's kind of a git for data, right? But at the same time, it's pretty much the opposite of what people were, were trained to do if they were not in this kind of data space. So if you're just like a database manager that was just born and raised in a kind of old school, um, it's totally fine for you that you just like, oh, this event is wrong. I'm going to change it because it made a lot of sense. So there's, there's, there's a little bit of, there's, a, there's really a mindset shift there. But for us, it becomes like, of, of capital importance that now the data are stored in the most raw and verbose way you can think of. And then you work your way to whatever abstraction you think is useful for your application. And if you don't like it, you burn it to the ground and you redo it because you have the raw data, which is the crucial, I guess the crucial takeaway. There are also a bunch of 
potentially interesting use cases, I think, that come out of the dia of the diachrony of the data that that you just never thought about because you didn't. What does that word mean? It's just like it's the fact that the data just like unfold over time. So now you have oh, like, okay. you know, you have like a temporal warm, you know, of what happened to your data, and now there's stuff you can do out of that. You can you can predict things. You can see trends. You can do time series. So there's a bunch of things that you you never thought about just because like your data before were were used to be just like, oh, that's it's always the last the last picture. Of, of what happened. There we go. Today's vocab word, diachrony. Diachrony, yes, or or temporal warm. You can choose what's the weirder. Yeah, this is this is this is cool because you know to summarize for the listeners that are listening, you know, this is my understanding, and I hope this is yours too. You know, Coveo is you know a unique business that's powering a lot of different uh, recommendation and e-commerce challenges in like a really hot sector of the economy. That means that there are some challenges around like personalization, customer service, all these different use cases have different underlying engineering implementation challenges and, and different trade-offs. But the most useful abstraction that can help power all of efficiencies across all those use cases is having a good handle on your data, having a good data infrastructure stack oh. process and sort of systems for working with data. Totally makes sense. Now, my question there is, what do the machine learning engineers focus on in that context? You mentioned that your machine learning engineering team has really grown in size. You know, traditionally, the way I've heard about it, a lot of these data abstractions and systems are the exclusive provinces of data engineers. That's the way it seems like a lot of other businesses right. are run. In that context where you know, okay, data management is where our business is getting a lot of value. How do you insert the machine learning engineers and what are the things they're working on on a day-to-day -day basis? So that's an excellent question. It's like one of the problems that I think like we don't have necessarily like a, a you know, a, a, a final recipe for it, but it's, it's, it's definitely one of the, 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 the main problems. So, because the point is, Usually what happens, I, I guess this is something that I can find in other organizations as well. So the idea is like when you hire like a data team or, or an ML team in the beginning, the team is kind of centralized, right? So you have like these people in one place and then they grow and then now you have like 15 of them, but they're still like one in one place. And in my experience, and I guess that comes from the fact that we were a startup and so we were focused on one single domain, um, that's not how it works. You actually, as a data scientist, tend to be more and more into the business case and more and more in understanding what's special about your data and why this is important given what you need to do. And so you become very vertical in that. I am totally fine with data scientists talking to clients directly, uh, which is not something that I see very often. But so how do you do that? Because now the two teams might have different, the data team and the machine learning team, they might even have like completely different tools. Right, so uh, if your machine learning team started doing machine learning a while ago, before like all this nice, you know, ecosystem of MLOps it was so florid, uh, chances are that you're like kind of scripting the data, you know, through with Spark out of an S3 bucket, right? And they might or might not be very ver well versed in, in SQL, for instance. It, that, it's, it's definitely a possibility. Like if you have like a data scientist that was trained in like 2015, um, he has that pattern, you know? Um, it, on the other hand, the business analyst is gonna go to like, I don't even know what that is. Like, I don't wanna touch it. Like I'm gonna ask you all everything because that's the only thing I know. So can you bring these two things together? Ultimately, the data schema and the data, the, la the latest steps in the data preparation must belong to the data scientist, to the machine learning engineer. It must, because it is the person that knows what the data are for. Now, can we standardize at least the tooling or like not necessarily standardize the tooling, but standardize, like settle on a language, for instance, at the very least, or settle on the same stack? Because that reduces greatly the complexity of running the department and the operations, which is part of what we're trying to do right now. 
So I'm wondering about the, the thing that uh, Jacobo told me when, because I am, I can only imagine how many people reach out to you, especially if they have their MLOps company and they want to know like, oh, what are you having trouble with? You're writing, basically you all put yourselves out there as some thought leaders in the recommendation system space. And that just gave you a big target on your back for tooling companies to come and say, I want... Everybody keeps selling me stuff. Yes, 100%. (laughs) I can only imagine. I can only imagine, man. So everyone is trying to figure out where you're having pain. And I loved what Jacobo told me. And he was like, yeah, actually, uh, I got it pretty good right now. Do you feel like there is any pain? Is there any... Like, if this were to advance in this space, where would you like to see it being advanced? I mean, in our case, so in our case, there's, we need to distinguish two things, right? So like one thing is you got your tool chain, you got your stack, I guess the, the you don't need a bigger boat repoted Yakubo, uh, built is kind of a platonic form of what the stack should look like, then you have actually an actual challenge to bring that into an organization that is bigger. They range from security concerns to people don't know this tool and they're they they they're skeptical about it or something like that. So th- there's, there's all kinds of then, like there's unfortunately a difference between uh, some, something that your team can adopt when you go into evangelization mode for the whole company, it's a completely different ballgame. Uh, the other thing is, I agree with Jacobo. Like, frankly, like right now, compared to when we started, uh, there's 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 so many tools that can help you out that you can. And, and we we like to kind of cherry pick, um, and that, that's just us. It doesn't doesn't mean that he has to be like that, but. Um, and if you cherry pick like the ones that you, that, that you like, you can you can do a pretty decent job, and even even I can do that, which is, you know, setting the bar very low. So, and that's great. Then the problem is what is gonna happen next? So for instance, right. So we have like a bunch of models that are built out of uh, data that are collected by our clients and they all sit in different parts. Every client is gonna have their own models and they're trained on their own data. This comes also from the fact that our clients are not particularly happy if we tell them, hey, we're going to you know, use your data to train a model of another group. Is this sustainable in the long run? Maybe yes, maybe not. We're approaching a world where pre-trained models there are, come out of the shelf or pretty powerful. So is there any way we can create data modes or operationalize fine-tuned models? They are larger in their nature but they will use down the road, maybe. And if that is the case, the stack that we build is exactly the same or not. Can we reuse everything we built or we need to move to something different? Jacopo insisted a lot on a thing that I like very much is like verticalize if you can. Don't go like, you know, with distributed computing if you don't need to, it's complicated. Um, is that something that is gonna change in the next year? Say, Kaleo, maybe, maybe. So the point is that there's, it, it's really evolving. Like for instance, for information retrieval, having pre-trained models on specific domains might be a good way to go, but that changes completely the, your strategy. So now you're actually in the business of training large models. There's a lot. <laughs> I think Demetrius <laughs> and I are sitting here kind of being like, huh. <laughs> to the, it's like to the, the point that, is like always be hustling i guess that's, sure. that, that's the thing like always try to always find you know there's always a corner you can cut sure yeah yeah i love that and, you know I, I really actually enjoyed that conversation that we had with with Jacopo around and that point around distributed computing right which is you know there's such an emphasis on um you know the most interesting tools or the most you know uh how could you say like opinionated way of doing things and sometimes it's just you know um it, it's really you know figuring out what works for your use case with as little effort i think we had on jeremy howard who kind of said like lazy engineers are the best right <laughs> yeah. uh, and uh, that that to me it makes a lot of sense 
I want to go back to um, the point that you were making around, you know, the different kinds of data professionals and how they interact with, you know, the way that your company has been structuring data and thinking about, you know, enabling users to use it, right? You mentioned the data scientist and, you know, that that, that person might think about accessing things in terms of Spark um, or, or scripting, whereas the business analyst is, is accessing things more via SQL and, you know, how that how the challenge there is to come up with, you know, a rational process and stack that works for all the different end consumers. Uh, is that a fair summary of kind of what you were saying before? I, I, I think so, because like, as I said, like the point is there's, there's one component that is of course, like figuring out, as you said, like a rational way to do that. And, and you can, you know, definitely find a way to you go, Oh, this is, this is easier than, than anything else we did. But then, there's kind of like being a software engineer kind of caters to your to the part of yourselves that uh, abstracts human flaws away to your thinking process. That's exactly right. So you right. get to the point where you go like, I mean, this is figured out, right? It's a solved problem. It's like, is it though? I mean, yeah. it is theoretically, but now yeah. we have a team that needs to be you know, talked into this idea. We we need to a team that maybe needs to learn a new a new a new skill set, um, and they're used to something different. Uh, maybe there's some serious reorganization that we need to do in in the in the whole department. And some people might like it, and some people might not because they like their manager. Or it, it, there's there's all kinds of problems at that point that 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 got in that can get into the way. And so yeah. we are in that process. I guess we have a blueprint of where we want to go. And it's very important then to understand where, like what compromises you're willing to do that will still maintain your initial vision faithful to itself. And what compromises are just like battles that you that you decided to die for, where you go to like, this is not going to happen. Screw that. I kind of wanted to ask, you know, from the perspective of, you know, let's say a member of that team, right? You're talking about sort of, you know, th the way that you, you know, set up infrastructure and process around these person, right? Like, I'm going to put you in a scenario here, right? I am a machine learning engineer on one of your teams. Uh, and this is actually kind of real for me, right? Where, you know, I sometimes struggle with that with thinking like an engineer, you could say, and thinking more like a data scientist or someone, right? It's, there's this, there's this always this battle between ops and engineering, you know, um, where you're kind of like, how do we build something that scales versus how do you solve the problem yeah. now, right? And this is often the challenge and the tension between business teams, sales teams, and engineering teams that product kind of exists to solve, right? But you are sitting there, and you know, you're, what is the advice? or the, high, the, the habits of high-performing ML engineers that you see in them that allows them to strike that balance correctly? What are some of the things- End-to-end slicing. Say that one more time, sorry. And End-to-end slicing. That's, that's my favorite thing that a good data scientist is able to do. And it goes back to the verticalization that I said. When what somebody, does that mean? It means that you build something that has a beginning and an end. It might be shitty. <laughs> but it has a beginning and an end. That's the very important piece. Like it's not a piece of a lot. It's it has a it's self-contained. Then we can fix it and we can go back to the pieces that we want to expand, make better. Some others will go in the bucket of, of you know tech depth and whatever. But being able to have that depth that brings you from zero to look, I made this thing. I understand this is not the kind of stuff that it can go like for global availability, but it kind of works. Can we try it out? That's definitely for 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 me is 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 really the sign that the person that that I hired is the right person has the right mentality. And it requires the point is that it also requires this person to go deep into the business case. That's that that's, that's the key thing, right? Right. I don't right. need, like, if somebody wants, if somebody is like, I'm going to train the model, that's, that's really what, 
what we do here. Like I'm a machine learning, I'm a data scientist. Like I'm gonna train the models. Like that's not how it works. You really need to talk to that person that is also culturally very different from you. Mm -hmm. Very different from you. Now you have to talk with an e-commerce manager or with an e-commerce PM. And, and you know that guy is different from, from, from the data scientist. And you have to learn not to be smug. You have to learn how to, you know, care about his problems. You have, you have to put yourself in, in his shoes. Then you go back and you build it. But I think that that works a lot in terms of productivity. It creates like a culture of iteration that I like very much. And most importantly, I think it's fun. Mm. Like yeah. it's a lot of fun because it's, you, you keep, you know, it's, it's a kind of an empathic way of doing things. I, I, I like that. I think that's, I think it's great advice. And I think it's, you know, you put it in very persuasive terms and I will say, I think a lot of, I feel this a lot internally. I think a lot of, you know, sort of like junior to mid-level professionals feel this right where you're on the individual contributor track. There's such a pressure to kind of be like, you know, how do I sharpen the sword, right? How do I get better at the thing I'm doing? But, yeah. you know, when you're really thinking about how to get ahead and what high performers do that impacts their environment and their company, it's that notion of end-to-end -end business understanding and working with others effectively. That's but also because it's it's a swift, I mean, it's like a kind of a Swiss knife meta. It, it also It's good for you to a certain extent, because like whatever super duper skill you're developing into some technical domain, unless you're like really, 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 really good at it. And so you're just like, right. oh, I do reinforcement learning, but actually, you know what? I can train Montezuma, you know, to that kind of like top of the field stuff. All your skill set is going to get old. Right. Soon enough, because automation is coming at a certain point. And so it, it's not a, it's not wise to sit on a on a small island of you know it's while your ability of like of understanding something in depth is larger than that and it's it's somehow quintessentially human that's the only thing you cannot automate it's quintessentially human like only human beings can do that can transfer knowledge from one domain to another go into the depth of all the details understanding and sometimes there are limitations that have zero things to do with code yeah that yeah. will still basically torpedo your brilliant idea right from the start because you know it's like people don't want to do that it's That's like so why good. i don't i don't know but they don't want to do that so it's not going to happen so there is something that i was going to ask you and as we're winding down you mentioned how you went out and you hired a bunch of machine learning engineers you grew the team First of all, how did you find the process? I know it's a very in-demand skill right now and uh, market, we could say, hot market. How did you attract talent? And then you also mentioned that later you weren't so sure if you actually needed these people. So how did you assess that? And did you just figure out, is there something that we can give them to do <laughs> that actually... Yeah. keeps them busy or did you have to end up firing people so first of all like i did not just uh, just just full, full disclosure i did not grow the team myself so we are in a in a in a unique position at Coveo, and part of that is probably because like we came through an acquisition and part of that is just because of our skill set where we we kind of help other teams to figure out these things but i have been blessed with the possibility of keeping my team freaking small, uh, and uh, and you know like and really choose my people and have like something super lean, but there are other teams at a certain point needed to grow, and uh, I think I like this again. So there's there, there's tooling is one piece, is the piece that is that everybody can see. You hire a young guy from you know. McGill University. We hire mostly Montreal. It's, it's a cool place where you can hire. Like it's highly competitive, but not like not New York or San Francisco competitive. Uh, but you can find like great talent. Um, chances are they might be young. So you want to give them like tools that they would like to use because they're going to see those tools in job descriptions because they want to like 
you, you, you want them to, to feel they're progressing. That's the first layer. The second layer is, do you, is the organization is the hardest one. It's okay, even if this guy has all the tools, does this person now feel empowered enough to go down uh, the rabbit hole of a business problem and came up with a good idea, go to his manager and say, look, I think this can work. Can we give it a try? And now the organization is built in a way that this person can do this and, can, and then can, it can be right or wrong and learn how to be right and learn how to be wrong. Because there's nothing more frustrating mm -hmm. than having like good ideas that, that are sitting on the shelf. You First of all, you're going to end up believing that they're like much better ideas than they probably are. Because, <laughs> you know, it's like, I have that figured out. They just don't let me do uh, it. It's like, or maybe not. Like we have to try before. There's got to be a name and, for that. Yeah. And then there's, uh, you know, like, and, and after a while, this person get frustrated. And, and now your ramp up is usually probably long. So there, there's a cost, there's an opportunity cost of losing an engineer that you train for like a year and a half and it's very high. Mm -hmm. and the organization piece is the hard one because sometimes there are like things that are impossible to move. Uh, we cannot bring things to production that tamper with customer data mm -hmm. because like we have customers that are very protective of their data from a privacy and security perspective. And we always has a lot of security in place because we serve clients that are in the financial uh, uh, service um, industry or, or healthcare, right? Um, sometimes there are things you can do about it. There is like, maybe you can promote a culture of like, I mean, try it out. Uh, worst case scenario, it sucks, right? The good thing about what we do is that all the models and all the machine learning and all the data science that we do is critical in the sense that brings a lot of value and is the bread and butter of, of the value prop. But none of them is a single point of failure. Like if, you're, if your new recommender system uses a model that is like, meh, it's fine. Like, it's fine. You can go back and, you know, like, it's like sorry, sorry about that. Uh, model, sorry. Uh, I'm going to do that again. So you can't do that without hurting yourself, I think. Too much. Incredible. Dude, this has been so good. Thank you so much, Cheeto. I thank you guys cannot yeah everything. I mean there's so much to chew on here and I think Vishnu and I are going to be talking about this for uh weeks to come and processing all of it so that's when you know it's it's a really I good episode not because that means that your weeks to come are really boring <laughs> it's like I hope you have better stuff to do <laughs> I really do man you undersell yeah, yeah. Totally. yeah. <laughs> go surf you undersell it man this, this was awesome. I, I can't thank you enough.